Okay, welcome back everybody. We're gonna continue with our open session agenda. I will turn this over to Rudy. Thank you, Eric. So um, we're gonna immediately get into three concepts uh, that are gonna be presented to the council. And I'll remind you that before NHGRI or any institute at NIH can publish a funding opportunity announcement, we need approval of, a, of an advisory group that's done in an open meeting. We always use the council so that you are always aware of whatever opportunities are being published by NHGRI. So we're gonna hear a presentation from the uh, two members of the staff uh, for the first concept. Uh, we encourage a discussion, lots of questions from council, and at the end of the discussion, I will ask to take a vote to approve the concept. So the first RFA is, or the first concept rather, is titled Consortium for Understanding the Impact of Genomic Variation on Genomic Function. And the presentation is going to be a tag team with Mike Pazin starting and then Dan Gilchrist, correct? So, thanks, everybody. We're going to tell you about a draft concept. First, I'd like to check, can people on the phone here, can you see that we have a title slide up? Actually, that reminds me. Joe Ecker, are you on the phone? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So Joe Ecker is uh, joining us for this particular concept. He's a former council member at the Salk Institute. Welcome, Joe. Thanks, Rudy. You, you can see our title slide up there. Yes. OK, thanks. I'm going to go ahead and proceed. I'd like to start off by thanking a number of people. Obviously, this uh, is a big effort, required a lot of contributors. I'd like to thank NHGRI leadership. I'd like to thank the NHGRI function team, program directors and analysts that work on this. Thank the, uh, we're in the Division of Genome Sciences, and I'd like to thank the division. But also, we've gotten a lot of in input from a key workshop that we had, the Genome to Phenotype Workshop. And I'd like to thank the participants there as part of the, parts of the discussion and letting us hear about different kinds of ideas that we could incorporate or not. So I'll give you a little bit of background, uh, tell you about where this comes from, why we think this is an important area of science to put a, have a major undertaking. Then you'll hear about the proposed scope and objectives. What is the concept that we're interested in uh, putting forth? That's what we would like to hear discussion from council members on, and you'll vote on later. We'll also tell you a little bit about how we think that this would relate to other ongoing activities if it moves forward. At the end, we'll have council discussion, and then we'll also have a formal vote. So I'd like to begin by quickly showing you what is the structure of the program that we're going to talk about, so that's not a surprise later. Uh, we expect to have these five components, and we think it's very important for them to work together as a group and help each other out with their different science. And they're going to cover different aspects of how genome structure determines genome function. In different ways, they'll get at uh, in different, they'll get at different aspects about how variation affects genome function. For instance, we'll have centers that will look at how um, elements function. We'll have centers that map activity of different elements. We'll try to put elements and variants into networks and pathways. We're interested in doing integrative analysis and also predictive modeling on the data as it arises, and then have a data coordinating data processing center. So, so the background. Where did we get, how did we get to where we are now? Uh, you, NHGRI strategic planning process, you heard this morning, started out in February of 2018. That's when we first previewed it with the council. And community input is very important to NHGRI. It's very important to NIH as well, hearing what are the needs of the scientific community in order to move forward. So we've been um, looking through and, hear, and hearing input from different uh, venues. A very important venue for us has been this genome to phenotype workshop. Uh, this meeting took place in January of 2019, and a report on it was presented in council in May of 2019. I should say that the proceedings of that workshop and also the council report are archived, and they're available to anyone that has access to internet. They're freely available. So the focus of this uh, workshop was the very general problem of how does um, genome changes in genome structure genome sequence relates to phenotype. It was not focused on functional genomics, yet we got a lot of important info about functional genomics at this workshop. And the concept is built in large part on feedback that we got from this workshop, though also other strategic planning venues. 
So the uh, workshop was planned around four different scientific topics. Again, not a functional genomics workshop. And one thing that struck us is across the different topics, we heard a strong need to do more functional genomics. Uh, a lot of ideas emerged in different areas of the, the different topic areas of the workshop, calling for more uh, functional genomics, continued uh, investment in functional genomics. So the, pr the concept that we're pr uh, presenting to you today, the, proposed, the concept proposal, is intended to address a number of different scientific challenges. The key is this overarching idea of how does genomic variation change genome function, all right? So no, we're not going to solve that in just five years, but that's the rubric that we wish to work under. We'd like to go from uh, today we have a lot of association studies. Can we get closer to having a causal understanding of what variants that are associated with disease or phenotypic changes do? We'd like to improve our ability to interpret variants. So in some cases, we have variants with no interpretation. In some cases, we have variants associated with a trait or phenotype. Often, we don't have much understanding of how they're mechanistically connected. And because that space is so huge, looking at the number of possible variants, the number of possible phenotypes, number of possible cell types, we don't think that in the near future, uh, let's stop there because it's harder to predict in the far future. We don't see a way in the near future that this will all be experimentally tested. So I think it's very important to develop approaches that one can do predictive modeling and make predictions about unseen variants. I mean, to provide some idea of the scope, if you were to look at, for instance, the NHGRI GWAS catalog, you'd find something like 70,000 associations from GWAS. Few of those have been characterized. Or if you look in NOMAD 3, you'll find some 600 million SNPs, some 100 million structural variants. Few, if any of those, it's known whether they're associated with any phenotypic change or disease. So we think that this is an area that's at the forefront of genomics. It's very important. We think NHGRI is positioned to make an important contribution here, building on our past efforts. Uh, so we want to continue, perhaps increase, our effort in this area. Uh, it's important for all to understand that, in our view, this concept uh, is only a portion of our area, of our work in function area. For example, following this, you'll be hearing about a concept looking at developmental gene expression, another function uh, concept. Uh, we think that this is going to be a foundational part of the strategic plan. We heard loud and clear at, uh, from input that functional genomics is something we should be working on now. And that's why we're bringing you this concept now, rather than waiting for the strategic plan to be complete. Last council round, you also had some concepts brought to you on the same premise. So I'll stop there and transfer to Dan. Thanks, Mike. So with this proposed program, NHGRI is taking on both a, a challenge and an opportunity, as Mike just spoke about. Identifying disease-associated variants is now more or less routine, but interpreting variant effects and understanding how they impact phenotype uh, is a major bottleneck. So the overall objective of the program we're talking about today would be to improve understanding of how genomic variation impacts function and phenotype to enable significant advances in our ability to interpret genomic variants and really help relieve that bottleneck. So I'm going to talk now more about the implementation that we envision. Uh, this will involve components of both research and resource building uh, and include data collection, analysis, and predictive modeling. So we're proposing an initiative composed of interrelated ideas that would build upon decades of work by the genetics and genomics communities and also bring together threads from a number of existing or former programs. Uh, systematic genome perturbation and characterization has been a central part of the Common Fund Links program, and it's also been an important part of the current phase of the ENCODE project. Systematic identification of functional elements and gene activity has been central to uh, the ENCODE project, the Roadmap Epigenomics project, as well as GTEx. Uh, and predicting predictive modeling, both of regulatory networks, 
and of variant causality has been explored in the Genomics of Gene Regulation program funded by NHGRI along with the non-coding variants program. So work in each of these areas we think would be important and integral to the program that we're going to be proposing. So as I mentioned, the overall objective of the program is to transform understanding of how variation impacts function and phenotype. This would begin to be addressed through a number of interrelated activities, uh, testing the impact of genomic variation on functioning, determining where and when regulatory elements and genes are active with single cell resolution, exploring the roles of specific sequences and regulating function in networks, developing computational approaches to model and predict relationships among variation, phenotype, and function, and through establishing a resource to enable future studies in this area by the community. As Mike touched upon earlier, uh, in the proposed program, each of those five interrelated activities would be focused within one of five interacting components. Functional characterization centers would experimentally test how variants impact function and lead to phenotypes. Mapping centers would identify where and when functional regions of the genome are active with single cell resolution. Regulatory network projects would advance network level understanding of the impacts of sequence and function on phenotype. Predictive modeling projects would develop and test computational approaches, predicting impacts of genomic variation on function and phenotype. And a data coordination center would generate a resource of data, tools, models to advance community investigation in this area in the future. So in a moment, I'm going to talk about how we envision each of these components working in more detail individually, and also how we think they could synergize to reach or work towards the program's larger goals. So the program would include both research and resource building activities. And we envision each component of this project to exist somewhere on a spectrum from those where the science is most mature and where there's the least risk involved to those where the science is at an earlier stage involving more risk, but also the potential for more, <clears throat> excuse me, innovation and reward. So mapping centers and data coordination centers are envisioned to exist on the resource building end of the spectrum, depending upon more mature science. Uh, and functional characterization centers are envisioned to contribute significantly to resource building. However, we recognize that the science in this area is less mature. And so these components, this component will include significant research activities as well. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, regulatory network projects and predictive modeling projects are envisioned to be research-driven, sort of pushing the boundaries of our understanding, in some ways similar to NIH R01 research project grants, but nonetheless making important contributions to developing a community resource. So now I'm going to go into a little more detail about each of these components and the goals that they help address. To improve understanding of relationships between variation, function, and phenotype, characterization centers would systematically apply high-throughput genomic perturbation methods, testing the impact of variation on either protein coding elements or non-coding elements or both, assaying the impact of genomic variation on molecular, cellular, and organismal phenotypes, Importantly, these centers would catalog the results, the tested variants, and their impacts, and share them with the research community. Uh, because we're still learning about the best ways to test the effects of genomic variation, refining generalizable approaches to perform these tests and catalog the phenotypes would be an important part of these centers. <clears throat> 
to determine where and when regulatory elements and genes are active with single cell resolution. Mapping centers are proposed to obtain biological samples of high value to the community and the consortium to establish multi-omics pipelines for high throughput mapping of functional regions at single cell resolution while preserving information about biological and spatial contexts of those activities. And in doing so, identify cell type specificity of regulatory elements and link them to specific genes. To explore the role of sequences in regulating networks and establishing phenotypes, regulatory network projects are proposed that would collect multi-omics data systematically with temporal and spatial resolution, measure differences in gene and regulatory element activity in systems undergoing state changes, uh, for example, profiling systems undergoing a change in cell state or cell fate, develop analytical approaches to identify regulatory networks using the collected multi-omics data, and identify network level relationships between genomic variants, functional elements, and phenotypes. <clears throat> So it's important to acknowledge that it's not feasible to experimentally test the impact of all genomic variants on all phenotypes in all contexts. So a key part of the proposed program is developing computational pro approaches to more accurately predict the impacts of genomic variants on function and phenotypes. To this end, predictive modeling projects would develop and test computational approaches, including novel methods for predicting the impact of genomic variants on function and phenotype, the location and function of specific elements within particular biological contexts, also interactions of genomic variants. Projects may also create tools to enable inferences about genome function. As we envision these projects, they would also play an important role in the larger program and be called upon to pro provide expertise, helping to prioritize samples, approaches, so that the consortium could perform the most informative experiments most efficiently. Finally, an important goal of the program would be establishment of a community resource to enable future studies in this area. And this would be anchored by a data coordination center, which would lead efforts to provide community access to all the data, software, models, and resources developed by the program. Make the data available in a form that's ready for advanced machine learning approaches. Work with standards development groups and other consortia towards facilitating data integration, performing joint analyses, and developing standards and sharing those standards and best practices. And finally, organizing consortium activities, including convening working groups and leading outreach activities. Some activities would be shared across most or all of the components, making data, software, and other products of the consortium available through the Data Coordination Center would actually be a shared responsibility of all the groups. Planning and implementing projects that span multiple of these components would obviously be a shared activity, as would be developing standards, data quality metrics, and best practices. And we do think developing standards and metrics uh, is one important thing that can come out of a larger program like this that's working together. All groups would also contribute to outreach efforts. This is being proposed as an interactive consortium because we think that there are important synergies that can be leveraged uh, both within each of these components and across different components. Within a component, coordination will be important for, we think, generating data that maximally covers the biological space that there is to be explored while avoiding redundancy, as well as ensuring that data are interoperable and have uniform metadata 
more easily to compute on in the future. Uh, synergies between different groups would also be leveraged. For example, characterization centers could prioritize samples that would be mapped by mapping centers. Sites of regulatory activity identified by the mapping centers could be tested by the functional characterization centers. Data from both characterization and mapping centers could inform predictive modeling efforts. And similarly, predictive models could help prioritize efforts by the characterization and mapping centers. And we envision similar synergies would exist across all components of the consortium. Additionally, uh, the data coordination center would work with data collection groups to produce interoperable data that are uniformly processed in a reproducible manner and to develop reproducible pipelines for data processing and analysis that can be shared with the community. So in these ways and others, we think an important part of the proposed program will be each component learning from the others to move towards their individual and their shared goals. A number of significant outcomes are envisioned for the program. Uh, these are focused on advancing understanding of how function is impacted by variation and leads to phenotypes and enabling communities working in this area to move forward at a more rapid pace. So movement in this direction will be aided by, we think, identifying and characterizing functional elements, both when and where they're active, and how genomic variation impacts their function, and modeling variants and elements, how they contribute to different networks and pathways. Towards improving variant interpretation, a key part of this that's envisioned for the program will be catalogs of the impact of genomic variants on function and phenotype that would be shared with the community as openly as possible and taking community input into account to make them as broadly useful as possible. A data resource would also be a key outcome of the program. This would be, as I mentioned, structured to enable machine learning approaches. It would include this database of tested genomic variants reporting the functional and phenotypic effects in particular biological contexts. It would also importantly include predicted effects of untested variants coming out of the predictive modeling centers. All raw and processed meta metadata would be available, made available as part of the resource uh, and shared with the community with as few restrictions as possible tools, models, methods, standards, best practices, and technological advances are also seen as important outcomes. So we're proposing that the program would contain a number of centers or research projects within each component, along with a single data coordination center. Uh, it's important to note that these groups would be working together closely but also would exist in a much larger community of researchers and other projects working in the same area. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Mike to talk a little bit about the relationship between this program, how we envisioned that working with other programs and projects. So I hope as you've been hearing about this, you've been thinking about what did we choose to put in this uh, proposal? And what is it that we left out and why? There are some uh, choices that we made where we didn't include topics as part of this proposed, as part of this concept, because we think they're happening well already in other places in NHGRI. So for example, if you look at technology development, we think that our unsolicited um, uh, program and our novel genomic technology program covers very well development of new experimental methods in this area. So that's not an explicit part of this proposal. Similarly, with respect to development of new computational methods, we think that's very important. All of these problems are not solved, yet a lot of that is happening already in NHGRI, again, through our unsolicited portfolio and through our computational genomics data science uh, part. We're also very interested in the idea of how this information can be used in a clinical context. 
Uh, we don't have a, a, a place for that in this particular FOA. Um, our variation function and disease funding opportunity, though, does take applications in that area. And I'd also point out that, whoops, our SEGS program is not bound by particular areas of science, but we have a number of SEGS now that overlap with experimental and computational methods in this area. So the field is benefiting from those as well. We're also thinking that we don't want this, uh, if we move forward with this, we don't want this consortium to exist in a vacuum, to function on its own. It's very important that it be integrated with other science that's happening at the time. So for instance, we're thinking that variant discovery projects and sources of curated variants, such as ClinGen, are going to be very important. We're thinking that this interaction is going to be bidirectional because people in the consortium will benefit from having variants that they can test and characterize uh, variants that can be training sets, but also information about those variants we want to get back out to the community. Similarly, there's a lot of single cell work that's happening in HubMap and in HCA. And we, we, are, we envision that we would work with them as partners uh, on shared data, shared uh, processing methods, shared technology. Uh, right now, NHGRI is part of IHEC, the International Human Epigenome Consortium. We would like that relationship to continue. Right now, it's shared um, resources and shared uh, experimental methods with respect to mapping. So what we're laying out here is a concept, an idea, to tackle one of the great challenges in genomics. How is it that genomic variation changes phenotype or changes, pheno or changes function? Uh, we think now is the time to try and make a bigger step forward and continue walking forward on this problem. So I'll stop there, and we're going to move on to discussion and a vote. Um, we're very interested in council feedback on any of these points. Uh, we're going to start off by first I'll call on Joe Ecker and then Steve Rich to provide high-level thoughts on what they've heard. And then we'll open it up for all council members for discussion. And you can discuss amongst yourselves. You can ask us for clarification on individual points as you see fit. And at some point, Rudy will call for a vote. So thanks. So Joe, can we hear from you first, please? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Loud and clear. Great. Great. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Mike and Dan and Stephanie for the very nice presentation. Um, <clears throat> I think the concept clearance captures very well a lot of what we talked about, what was discussed at the um, genome to phenotype workshop. Um, and I uh, congratulate you guys on doing that. I mean, you got the message about function loud and clear, um, and the, map, the functional uh, uh, centers will be really value, additional value that hasn't really been realized, I think, at this scale. I just had a, a couple of questions about, I think the goal here is to have the, 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 the whole be greater than the sum of the parts, and therefore the interactions that you described, I think, are very, very useful. There's just a couple of questions. You mentioned something about high-value samples in the, uh, I don't know if it was the mapping centers or the, or the, the um, functional centers, but do you envision that, you know, I can imagine that, that tissue or material that is of value to one group could provide an input for example, for, for other groups to be able to utilize with their technology. For example, if you have groups that have developed a system uh, for studying function that, you know, understanding the variance in that system would be, would be very useful. So how do you envision, what do you think about sharing a high value code samples? So, so we would very much like the different groups to work together. And for example, um, a, mapping group, a, a mapping type group might learn about the biology of a particular organ or tissue, and that might spur ideas for how a, function, a networks group might study that. And we think that then they could work together that if there were, for instance, mapping information that might inform doing network studies, or network studies might suggest uh, samples that one might follow up for functional characterization or predictive modeling. I just 
<clears throat> would add that uh, a number of the projects that Mike and I and others already work with um, are using. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'll use this one. Um, programs we're already involved in have used sample sharing across components of the ENCODE project, HubMap, which is one that we work with in the Common Fund, and possibly the 4D Nucleome program also does this. So there is some precedent for sharing samples across components like that. Uh, I had another question also about um, what, if any, uh, is the role of, you know, model organisms for studying function. I know we talked about some examples at the, at the workshop of where would you see that that would fit in to this function, functional study? Right. So I think the current thinking on this is that um, the goal of the program is to really advance understanding how this is working in human health and disease, how variation is impacting function and phenotype. And so uh, there would be a, a strong preference for work to be performed in mammalian systems and human systems where possible. Uh, but it would be up to investigators to make the case that if a particular area was more amenable to study in a specific model system, um, and there'd be high value in that, that's something that could be considered. And my last question. Um, so you, you recently, NHGRI funded the Reference Genome Mapping Centers, which I think is really terrific. That was the other thing that was discussed at the Genotype to Phenotype Workshop was having real, quote, real genomes. So can you imagine that some of the systems that are in this program, if it's, if it's voted successfully, uh, could be uh, that the genomes could be developed from the mapping center so that you actually, when you map regulatory elements, it's mapping to, you know, a complete genome. Do you see any interactions with that program? So you're asking the question of would the particular reference genomes coming out of the HGRP, the Human Genome Reference Program, uh, be sources for this project? Yeah, I, I'm thinking about integrating so that mapping or functional data is actually carried out with the full genome, and it could come later, that is, the reference centers might consider using some of the high-value samples that are coming from this project for the references. Yeah, we're certainly open to the idea that if it turned out a number of samples came with this, uh, from an individual, so with the same genome, then if that could become an HGRP sample, that would be a benefit. And Joe, this is Carol, and I, I, one of the things we've talked about internally, and I just want to touch base if this is sort of what you're talking about, is that, you know, as we, as we improve our reference genome and sort of address the dark matter, if I'm going to use probably the wrong term, but getting a better idea of the genome, functionally making sure that our functional characterization is covering that entire space. And so is, is your question sort of thinking about sort of identifying what, what we're functionally characterizing and how efforts like the genome reference can improve our understanding of what we need to be characterizing, or am I not, or was your question per something else? Precisely. Okay. Per Precisely. You, you, that is, yeah, the, the goal of that program is to really flush out what's missing, and you'd like to have that within the functional characterization and the mapping as well. And so, yes, Carolyn, exactly right. And I'll give Jen Troyer a little shout out for being one of the people who, who pushed this as something for us to be considering as we think about activities as well. Okay, I have a Couple okay, that's all for me. Great. Uh, this is Steve. So I have just a couple of comments and a couple of questions. Number one, this seems like an incredibly ambitious program, uh, and not just from the science standpoint, but also logistically, and how you're going to have, by my count, seven to ten awards to functional characterization, three to five for mapping centers, five to seven regulatory, and then six to eight predictive. And 
So in a sense, you're going to have individuals that need, say, the, the seven to 10 functional characterization centers have to work together in a sort of a working group model to figure out what they want to do and coordinate that with the three to five centers that are mapping who decide what they're going to do and how to integrate with the functional group and then the regulatory network, same way with predictive modeling. And that's a huge sort of just logistical question that it's hard to even see how a data coordinating center can, can coordinate all that, much less keep track of all the data and curation and so forth. So I, I just want to you know, indicate that there is some concern about just getting this program up and running. And my guess is it's probably going to take a significant amount of time just to get these people to know each other and start hammering through the protocols. So to think that it's going to get started on day one is probably, you know, you probably don't believe it anyway, but it's going to take some time for them to just get up and understand what's going on. Um, and it gets to the point of you're really looking at the modification of the genome for variation to predict function in time and space under a stable environment. Because you're not manipulating the environment at all. And yet we know that for you know, different cell types, different you know, organ systems, whatever happens to the environment may change totally what the function is of how the genes operate. So could you sort of comment on how you're going to think about having a, a series of cells, tissues, organoids, intact you know, units that make sense across time and space to allow the network people to divine the networks that are used in prediction what the function is. I agree this is going to be a big challenge. Um, you know, so part of by having this as a consortium, the simpler part, but no might but by no means the easy part, is to try and manage overlap and to have sample to have centers that are applying related techniques have only a small amount of overlap so we can compare results across centers, but you know, not everybody does the same biological system. Um, we are hoping that we get impact in information from the computational groups, predictive modeling groups. So from the beginning here, what would be a good way to look across biology? To what extent should we be looking across development? To what extent should we be looking across body plan? To what extent should we be drilling down in a few particular cell or uh, uh, organ uh, types? But I, I personally don't think there's a single unique correct answer to how best to do this. So we'll be, we'll be looking for input from the different groups and how to do this work together with program staff. But yeah, that's the approach. Frank, can I interject? Can you give some sort of a contrast? Because one of the issues that Steve raises is just sheer number of components that you're trying to herd. Can you give some sense, um, ENCODE at its largest size, how many components did it have and how does that compare it to this overarching program? Yeah, so I think uh, we're on the order of mid-20s to 30 components right now within for, ENCODE. For ENCODE. For ENCODE. There's one data coordination center that helps a great deal with managing all those different groups. So not radically different than the sheer number of components here. I realize there's some other differences in how it's organized, but just by sheer number of cats being herded. The other thing I would point out, and... This is true of ENCODE today as well. We would envision that some of these projects would be more closely managed. Some of them would be more loosely managed. So current thinking is that somebody that's doing a regulatory network project, we don't know so much about how best to do this today. To a large extent, they would be proposing their system, doing their own thing, benefiting from being in the environment of the consortium. So not all of these things are subject to the same amount of management and coordination as point. Yeah, just a couple other quick things, I guess, is you're going to be have generation of primary data, and the people who are working in regulatory networks and predictive modeling will be working with that primary data, but they have to wait until the primary data are generated, QC, you know, so forth. So how are you going to 
I think it's really important to get the people who are doing the networks and the predictive modeling in at the beginning so they have some, not only knowledge of what's going on, but also some idea of how the data are being produced and, and actually give feedback as to, well, these are the types of data and, and so forth. So I think it's really critical to make certain that these people are involved at the beginning and, and really will help the project. And the other part is just, as I, as I mentioned before, I think having all the data and, the, and as much modeling and prediction work done on Anvil probably would be a useful thing, especially if you can make it free uh, to the investigators so you don't have to pay for the computation and the space and everything else, but, um, and then see how that can be integrated with other sources of genomic data. And I'll stop there. I've got Hal and then Trey and then Mark. Thank you. So um, it seems that the comparison to ENCODE is in some ways relevant, but in other ways not quite fair. I mean, ENCODE was meant to be a catalog, if you will, encyclopedia of elements. But here to understand how they work together um, is, a, is a much greater challenge and perhaps a much bigger burden for the coordinating center not to simply collect data as it comes out of the other initiatives, but to make sure that the other initiatives are coordinated in their consideration of system and context to be able to speak to interaction, to crosstalk, to, uh, I, 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 having each of these entities doing its own thing will not necessarily lead up to the, the sum that's greater than the, the parts. Um, so is it envisioned that the coordinating center is going to have a sort of a proactive role in actually dictating what types of questions or problems are going to be addressed in what order? And I think the current thinking on that is that that's largely a program responsibility and would fall outside of the, the activities of the Data Coordination Center, so. So, I, I mean, I think this is a thing that we are also really interested from thoughts and feedback about are there, we recognize this as a challenge in this whole how do you make programs bigger than the sum of their parts, and we like to think that we have lots of examples where we've done that, and then the opportunity to learn from those things. You know, I think some of it falls on the coordinating center, some of it falls on a really well-designed steering committee within the group, some of it comes from the sort of NIH idea. But if there's things that you think we should be thinking about as we sort of, if we move forward with this concept to help with that, we also, and this is, I'm looking at you because you asked, but we're open to anybody in terms of if people think there's some key things that you really think we should be considering as we to, that would really help address that and help mitigate that concern. I mean, I think we try to do it through building in good incentives and good ways and ways to resource the group so that they do have that ability to, to work together, both the coordinating center and the individual groups. But if there's more to it than that, I, you know, I just want to make sure we're hearing that from you as well. I'd love to hear the perspective of others, but it doesn't seem that a, an occasional a weigh in from a steering committee is going to be sufficient. You know, what I'm imagining is day to day operations are going to need to be intimately coordinated. Protocols are going to need to be standardized. Um, cell types, tissue sources, um, it's going to require meticulous detail to data, uh, with regard to day to day coordination. Just from, from hearing, description and, and this follow-up question and this was what one of the thoughts I had when I read the, the description is that because of what Hal just described it seems like perhaps a better approach is to have several groups each with all these comp or some of these components that work together and remove the coordination because that might end up introducing inefficiencies and let each group do its thing and at the end, then share everything through Anvil or whatever. When each group has its own person that, or group that does these things, they, they're they're going to be interacting much more often, and with a with a with a goal of as a group delivering something. 
So just so I understand, so you mean that groups will form that would have representatives from each of these four functions and they will act as an entity and then there would be another group doing things in parallel? Is that the thought? Yeah, so you'll have, I guess it will, it will be more like a SAG, I guess. So a, a research institute will put in a proposal for doing this on a subset of the, of the ambitious goal. Okay, so so as you guys know, I, I am a supporter of this idea, of this concept, and and I think it's shaping up to be an even nicer concept uh, since the last time you guys uh, described it to us. Um, I support everything that's being discussed about the organization of a complex program and the role of the environment. But let me, so, so I, think, I think my comments, I'm just going to reduce to names of things but in the name i think is maybe an important clarification at least if not if not discussion and i want to sort of clarify two components of of the naming up here one um, relates to what you call a regulatory network and the other relates to what you call mapping uh, so so first things first so so when i read the objective up here it's quite clear and i, I actually like exactly how you've thoughtfully worded that, to explore the role of functional genomic elements in regulating networks and influencing uh, phenotypes. Um, presumably, when you say that, you don't just mean transcriptional gene regulatory network, but you also mean potentially metabolic networks, signaling networks, maybe even cell-cell communication networks and beyond. Um, and so my, if that's the case, then my suggestion is remove the word regulatory from the name and call it gene network, or if you want to include cell-cell interactions at a later date, or at least let people propose that, um, then call it molecular and cellular networks, but, but generalize it. That, so, so that would be my, my recommendation. On the other hand, if you really want to make this just, just about that one kind of gene regular, you know, cis or trans gene regulatory network, then I think you got to change the language in your objective. But, but anyway, that's, that's one what's hopefully a helpful comment. Now let me get to the mapping. So I think, now, now Steve's comment about three I made me unclear about whether the network projects are mapping projects or not. I thought they were when you first proposed them, but at least for now, the way I've heard this is that the first three components are types of mapping. Uh, the first component could be called mapping the effects of genetic perturbation. The second component is really mapping, as Joe pointed out, uh, genome elements. And the third component, I, I thought, might have an experimental component. It wasn't clear relating to mapping of gene, gene, and other kind of molecular interactions. And so again, uh, maybe just to clarify, if that's actually true, I would consider using the word mapping more equitably across those three, either stripping it entirely or, or specifying those three kinds of maps, um, which all sound really cool, actually, and, and necessary, but just clarifying that that's that's actually what's intended. Okay. Mark. So I'm, I'm very enthused about the, the program also. Sounds great. Um, and one thing I was happy to see was that when you were talking about the interplay between the components, you were saying that the predictive modeling may influence what gets experimentally characterized. Um, but I would just encourage you to draw one more arrow there because I think the, the network projects also, a lot of that will be predictive modeling, and those projects as well might influence what happens in the first two components. Um, well, so while we're on <laughs> nomenclature, uh, two quick comments and a more general comment. So genome function is actually kind of an interesting term, and I really thought about it like genome function meant replication or something, you know what I mean? Like I didn't think of it of how the variants impact how the genes work. So I just, the language should be clear about that. But my biggest concern really is the mapping centers. And so 
I actually had emailed, I forgot, I think the two of you before this, I'm also very concerned about the number of different components and the number of different grants. Um, and I think the first one could frankly sop up all the money um, and not, not finish the job. So the functional characterization, if you wanna go back to the four of them, it might be easier. I think it, I think that's critical and the field is really calling out for that. Uh, and I do think trying to coordinate all these different components, I, I, you know, the answer about ENCODE, I don't think ENCODE started with this many, like they may have gotten to this many somewhere along the way. But I'm really concerned about the mapping centers because to me, that really seems a different question. It almost seems to fit more with the developmental expression that we're gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, maybe I misunderstood it. And I think that really trying to understand how genomic variation in, impacts gene structure and gene function, um, particularly in multiple tissues, is a huge project that I really wanna see done well. Um, and so my concern by trying to pull all these different components into this program, that there, it may be more complicated, the network, the network of these grants may be more complicated than needed, uh, and you may lose some of the goals. Um, I also was a little surprised there wasn't a little more discussion about the types of models, like organoids are mentioned somewhere in the, in the write-up. But I think that's going to be critical and really thinking about what models these different groups use so that they can easily compare data is going to be really important. So to me, really emphasizing the coordination of those types of questions to really get the functional characterization centers off to a great start is critical. And I'm concerned that all these different components may take away from the overall success. Steve. So I'm, I'm also very supportive of the program. I think it's in a great direction. I guess one question or one, perhaps one view of this may be that, you know, this may be the great vision of what you're trying to achieve long term. And I think the question is, are there a few things that you could evolve into this program with? And a couple of the uh, comments that have been made here. For example, I really like the perturbation model of perturbing a genome and asking what's happened and what you did emphasize sequence. But of course, there are a lot of other perturbations. There are perturbations, as mentioned, I think Steve mentioned, that there's environmental perturbations. There's, envir there's perturbations on a single genome that can give different results. And um, the other point is on model organisms or maybe model systems. You know, it could be different organisms, it could be different organs, it could be different cellular conglomerates of some sort, communication between cells. But the, the question I would have is, kind of coming back to what Raphael said, is it makes sense that, you know, do we have a model system that says, by studying perturbation, you know, genetic or environmental perturbation, that we can actually have a predictive model of how perturbations affect phenotypes or how phenotypes may backward integrate into genotype. And, you know, it, so it may not be that you want to jump into all of these things simultaneously. It may be that small groups have some ideas of a small system that can actually demonstrate this and you can learn from it and then kind of understand how you should populate this as time goes on. And, and it wasn't clear from your presentation whether, you know, you would just jump into this and populate it immediately. But those are just some things to think about. Um, but overall, I think it's a, a great project. Okay, I've got Jonathan and then Brent Gravely. I'm warning you, I'm gonna call on you next. So I, I wanna go back to the, sort of the, the organization part of this because it really does worry me that we're talking somewhere between 20 and 30 different you know, individuals, projects going on and trying to coordinate all of that. So, I mean, one way to do that is just to, you know, fund all those things, put all those things out there, let them come together, and then try to figure out how they're going to all interact. I think that's dangerous because I think it's going to take a really long time for everyone to try, really try to get together. Um, the other approach, which Rafi has already talked about, 
is, you know, have themes, you know, get subgroups together that might include three of these different activities or four of these different activities, or maybe even two of these different activities, but have them get together under some, some you know, coordinate, some coordinated thing, and then maybe they coordinate in some, you know, broader way. The, the other approach would be to throw, put some sort of framework on this, on this before it goes out. So have some better idea. And this is, I think, goes back to the idea that program might be part of where the coordination comes in. Maybe having a framework out there so that people aren't just totally going in without any idea of how it's coordinated before you put it there. So I don't know what that framework would look like. But uh, you know that might be another way of doing it. But I think some sort of coordination activity needs to happen before this before this gets out there. Okay, Brent, do you have thoughts? Shall I go? Please go ahead. Oh. Um, sorry, I I had to unmute. Um, no, I I think I'm in favor of it. I think uh, the concerns of it kind of being a larger sprawling project have been addressed. Um, and I think as long as there's sufficient coordination and um, management, I think it should be fine. But I think this is clearly an area that needs to be pursued uh, in the field. And I think the direction has a uh, great promise for new insights. Jeff, go ahead. So a question, I, I, since this is really going to focus primarily on uh, human uh, systems, and I assume uh, it's going to be new recruitment into uh, sample acquisition and that sort of thing, I think the question is whether you thought about it, some sort of modest LC component to help, I'm guessing, with the coordination center to help set standards and uh, issues around privacy, data sharing, consent, return of results, those sorts of things might well be uh, issues that somebody of that sort could contribute to. And then perhaps one smaller point, if indeed the coordinating center is going to be responsible for more than data, and it sounds like that's what folks are talking about, is name change, call it a coordinating center, and really make them responsible for uh, a lot of the uh, planning and the work groups and uh, standards that are uh, all part of this that may go beyond the data elements. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, I think that's a really good idea. We have examples in this space, and Mike can speak to this a little bit more than I can. So, like, IHEC, which is one of the groups we talked about coordinating that international group, has a ethics and LC group that sort of talks about this. And I agree, as we move in the sort of functional genomic space more into working with more directly with humans, that's an important area to go. And we haven't Pat put that much thought into it yet in the concept as we've been developing it, but we have a really good, you know, Dave already had some really good thoughts of things to do, and I think that's something we'll take under consideration as we move forward on how to best add that in and make sure that we are doing this in that in a good way. The other part that we didn't spell out, but somebody else brought up at one point, is thinking about as we go into this making sure that we're having diverse representation of who's being sampled and those types of issues as well. I think there are a lot of sort of underlying things that it would be important to make sure that we're really focusing on as we make this type of level of investment. I don't know, Mike, if you, or Dan, if you'd have anything more on top of that. So it was suggested that some of the guidance um, might be programmatic. Um, do you imagine early on in the process saying, you know, let's tackle glucose homeostasis, immunologic maturation, and myogenesis first? Um, go do what you do, um, but let's use those as test projects and things to learn how to model uh, from. Um, is, is that a, a concept? For the, for the network type projects, which I think get most into how systems actually work, um, barring several groups proposing to do the same topic, they would largely likely do as they propose rather than program officers tell them this is what you would study or how you would study it. Uh, whereas if we look at component two, the 
you know, identify when and where regulatory elements are active, there it's very important to make sure that we don't have centers just duplicating each other's effort. There it's important to put together some kind of coherent plan, sampling across the body plan, sampling across development. So there, there would be programmatic involvement with the uh, PIs, steering committee. But I don't think we would get to detailed scientific questions as you, pro as you but, posed. But to get back to Raphael's original comment, this is the issue, right? So you can imagine, take myogenesis, right? You could then have functional characterization centers looking at myo D1 and DMD and da da da, and you could have mapping centers looking at the regulation of that and the networks. But if you have all these different groups coming in with very different, I mean, these models are all going to be different, and you're going to have to model, you're going to have to do the functional characterization differently if you're talking about development of muscle versus hereditary cancer. So I, I do think they're having some idea of how these different groups are going to attack the same problem is important. I don't know if this addresses the question that you're talking about, but one, one strategy we could do is, for instance, every system that's proposed to study regulatory networks, we could say, well, that's something where we should also be identifying when and where elements are active. That's also a system where we should be doing some perturbation and seeing what the elements that are found in the networks do. So, so I think it's actually more acute than that. I, I, I'm not sure how you do component one without having made these decisions. So I think it's not just making sure that component one covers some of the, the model pathways people choose to study, but I, I, don't you have to choose your functional readouts? Uh, you know, so you're perturbing the genome, and what are you measuring in, in component one? And I think that, that was where I understood the, the questions really be most acute and, and some of this discussion and need to harmonize across groups, because if you're not careful, you know, the most basic thing you're going to do is, you know, a genome-wide CRISPR assay for growth, for competitive growth, and then you're going to move beyond that to someone's going to study homeostasis, someone's going to study cell cycle arrest, someone's going to study cell migration, and, and blah, 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 blah. And those are all great projects, but they're not going to harmonize. So, I, so, so to me, I think you've got to somehow guide or coordinate one, first off and foremost. I agree that that, that kind of level of coordination is important in the um, characterization centers. Otherwise, they'll have readouts that are not directly comparable. So I had one more thing, and it's it explains why I'm having trouble with with, with, with accepting that this is going to work as it's as it's uh, currently uh, explained, and it's. It helps to think about the deliverable. So the Human Genome Project is very clear what you were doing. You were getting, for every location, a base. For ENCODE, it's a three-dimensional matrix of zeros and ones, and you and it gave us a subset of that, and now they're trying to fill in the rest with imputation. But here, I don't, I don't know what the, the deliverable could be. It's just so massively, oh, the possibilities are just massive. Jonathan Pritchard, did you want to comment? You have to come off mute first, Jonathan. Sorry, thank you. Um, so I think that the concept is great, and uh, you know I think it's you know just what NHGRI should be doing, and uh, and the discussion has been really good. Um, so one kind of thing that I wanted to add a little bit on is. I'm trying to understand exactly um, what scales you uh, expect this to be um, focusing at. So, um, you know, so I guess I would draw a distinction between understanding how genetic variation is affecting uh, what's going on within cells versus at the scale of tissues and whole organisms. And, um, you know, and, and I think different parts of the document left me a little bit confused about exactly, you know, whether you whether you see understanding the sort of the, the whole um, pipeline from, you know, variation to organismal phenotype as being part of this. And, and I bring that up because in some ways I think that that's the most challenging problem that we've 
have that we face now. So, you know, if you think about, you know, experiments for understanding how genetic variation is going to affect, you know, aspects of what's going on inside cells, you know, for most of these, you can imagine what the experiments are, but, you know, scaling these up to understand, you know, how variation is, you know, feeding through to produce organism level uh, effects. Um, how to do that in high throughput is still much more challenging. Um, and yeah, so I, I wanted to get to your get to your uh, views on how you're thinking about that, and uh, you know, and whether that should be made clearer going forward. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that comment. So I think you're right. As you go up that scale of complexity, uh, sorry. As you move up the, the scale of complexity from a cell to an organism, um, it does get much, much more difficult. Um, I think that we are open to exploring that whole spectrum, but that um, at least at a f the first expectation is that a lot of that work would be done at more of a cellular level than organismal. Okay, thanks. I'd say the one, the one exception would be in the network modeling projects where we're, you know, it's easier to take into account that one could use spatial resolution and say these cells are next to each other. They're, quote, the same cell type with the same genome, yet they're doing something very different from each other. Why are they different? Can we learn something possibly about what's happening from the, about what, about the cellular context is important. But I do see how this relates, Rafa, to your point of sort of the this determining bounding on this. If we if we say, okay, this is the theoretical matrix we're trying to fill out, that helps provide a way to sort of put boundaries on some of these questions as they come up, versus saying we can go out and anything's game if you match some of these words. And so I do think that's something as we develop, as we move forward with this, that does need to be part of what I think is developed. And the better that's developed, the better we can figure out the right structure around this. Um, and so certainly if there's people have sort of thoughts on that, I, we're happy to sort of hear that. But, I, you know, obviously going from the concept moving forward, that has to be designed at some point. Or otherwise, what is this that we're, we're trying to collect together? But if the ultimate goal is to sort of get a predictive model right. out of all of this, then it does seem like using a simpler system would be a big benefit. Now, there are going to be applications in human, obviously, that maybe are low-hanging fruit, and it makes a lot of sense, and completely applicable. But you know, somebody's got to put the fundamental effort <laughs> into trying to get a very basic, simple system where we can get a predictive model of function. Well, I mean, I would disagree with that. I mean, we've spent however many, 50 years of human genetics learning about what genes are important for disease. And I think that certainly focusing on at least a subset of those and understanding their impact on disease phenotype or appropriate proxies is certainly within our scope. Um, and, um, By the way, I don't disagree with that. Right. So I, I, I just hope the, the message doesn't get across that it should be just very... The, the issue that's come up in the medical genetics community is to make sure that the assay you're using is actually predictive of disease. And that's where I think some of the predictive modeling projects might be uh, particularly useful. Similarly, ClinGen, for example, you had ClinGen in kind of a funny place on your diagram. We're like waiting for data from group one. I mean, we're setting up all of our systems to try to rapidly ingest large amounts of functional data so that it can be combined with what genetic and disease specific data is available for those genes. So, I mean, there's definitely a, a, a huge need in the medical genetics community for large scale, well, really statistically robust functional characterization assets. So Sharon, whether it's a model system like budding yeast or whether it's a model of disease, would you nonetheless support this notion that I think is evolving, which would be something like for, for activity one, program does script a list of, say, disease phenotypes that are of high interest? I mean, I right? personally or think... Somehow scope the activity? 
Yeah, I, I actually don't think it's that different than the current common uh, sequencing centers where um, a group of disorders, if, if I remember it, I didn't apply, so I can't tell you, but uh, a particular disease group were selected. And so I do think if, if you really want to do all five, you're hearing all of our concerns about coordination. One way to help the coordination is to pre-select some very large disease areas and at least let people apply saying they're going to focus on this one or that one. I think it will make it a lot easier to then try to coordinate across these multiple different grants. You're suggesting pre-select prior to issuing the funding opportunity as opposed to select after we see who's... Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, it's interesting. So I guess... It, sorry if I'm getting my acronyms wrong. Is I think Ignite took an interesting approach where it kind of said you could propose them, but then uh, for trials in this case, and then the consortium selected, right? I just think you need something. You need some way of sorting, whether it's pre or post, so that there's some vertical integration across the slide that the coordinating center doesn't have to do. So, so, so to couch this in terms of Rafa's matrix, I feel like the fundamental problem is the genome is is numerical. It can be numbered. There are three billion base pairs. There are twenty thousand genes. There are this many chromosomes, and so that defines the sort of some of the dimensions of that matrix. Um, or you know, ENCODE has a larger number of elements. But uh, the problem with phenotypic space, of course, is that it is infinite, and so you have to deal with that by making sure that your proposals have some overlap. Jeff, and then Hal looks troubled, so he's next. Yeah, well, <laughs> since we're brainstorming here, um, wondering about, say, uh, category one as an example, uh, instead of funding seven to 10 independent awards, why not fund three trios where the applicants have um, decided that they have synergistic activities and they describe in their applications how they're going to work together, uh, how they're going to coordinate their activities. Still need a coordinating center, but you've uh, minimized the um, large number of potentially uh, wide-ranging projects that then you'd have to synthesize. So I, I like the concept that's emerging from Rafa and from Sharon uh, and others. Um, I'm not sure that I would focus on a disease entity. I think focusing on some developmental or physiologic process is going to inform the diseases that derive from Yeah, no, absolutely. Right, and that's um, why I thought your example of myogenesis was a good one, because there are some diseases, but there's all kinds of interest in physiology. It relates to health. It relates to activity. But at least people know where to aim their assays and their models. So. I agree. It shouldn't be specifically a disease, but a process, an organ system, or something. Yeah, I mean, and I like an early concept that was introduced where a center from one through four is gonna, they're going to say, "Hey, let's form a little group and attack myogenesis, or let's form a little group and attack whatever." Um, but then it would be necessary to have that kind of synergy already developing at the time of applications. So that's going to be a, a tough but probably worthy exercise. Yeah. OK, I just counted to 10, and it was silent. So unless there are any last thoughts. I'm going to bring us to closure here. Anybody on the phone want to speak some more? Joe, do you have additional thoughts? Yeah, just just a comment. I, I you know, I when I brought up the idea of using sort of common tissues and things like that with the idea that you'd want to have some systems. For example, if you were studying, for example, brain, and you were then had a group developing functional assays in organoids that were brain-like, then they might be able to coordinate. So, uh, but I, I wouldn't prescribe, I wouldn't necessarily prescribe a disease nor a model system, uh, but I think that the centers could decide after funding that they wanted to work on X number of model systems to be able to inform not only, you know, function, but then the regulatory network projects. So I think with the right kind of 
guidance that this could be possible within the program that's been outlined. Okay, Brent or Jonathan, final thoughts? Nothing to add. Okay. Can I get a motion to approve the concept? Go ahead. Sorry. Are we going to be voting on the agreement to, I heard a lot of support for the overall concept, but people's concerns about the complexity and some recommendations about how to focus. I didn't hear any consensus about what we're focusing on, but I did hear that people felt a lot more comfortable knowing you would go back and find some way to either pre-specify or after you get your applications focus. Is that what we're voting on or the $40 million for this so, as originally proposed? So I'm choosing to view this as a lot of advice some of which we will embrace, some of which we will not, as opposed to we have rewritten, you, the council, have rewritten this, this concept to mean the following things. We, you, you're, Rafa's right. You're voting on that. But, but you're voting on that, but we may choose to uh, modify numbers, structure, I mean, based on the feedback we've got. Now can I get a motion to approve the concept? Thank you. A second. All in favor? Keep your hands up, please. One, two. One, two. Okay. And opposed? And abstaining? And the people on the phone, if you would just send me an email, please, letting me know whether you're voting to approve or disapprove or abstain. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Okay, Jyoti, do you want to come up to the podium, please?